Minnesota winters just they, they took a toll on you and, and I I you know working outside all the time was also rough so in the weekends Saturday and Sundays I, I took up ice fishing and uh, I actually found I really enjoyed it I had found this lake kind of right on the edge of this marsh there's a lot of marsh in northern Minnesota a lot of people bogs and marsh and I found this little lake right on the edge where I knew no one could get to outside of the winter when everything was frozen over and I, I drilled a hole through the ice and I mean it's just pristine I mean just wilderness there's nothing as far as you can see um, out to the west at the edge of the lake there were these reeds that kind of surrounded the whole lake they're you know six seven feet high and then beyond that it was just marshland I, I look over to the other side of the lake and I noticed it was the craziest thing it was like this head and shoulders kind of lifted up above the reeds it, it could remind me of what it would look like if like you did a puppet show and you stuck a puppet up above a curtain it just kind of rose up like that slowly and, and just stood there it was just a head and shoulders it you know at the time I remember thinking that someone had was must be standing on a snowmobile behind the reeds in this huge winter suit. The figure was incredibly dark, almost black, and it was a head and then sh these big shoulders. It, there was no, like there's no neck or, and you could see part of the chest too. There, there must be a, a guy on a snowmobile standing up to get up above the reeds in this huge winter black suit. And so I'm kind of looking at it, trying to kind of make sense of it, and it, it just it just shrinks back down. The, the head and shoulders go back down, it disappears. And a few minutes later, two of them pop up, uh, the same one as before, and another one uh, about the same size, maybe a little bit smaller. And, and they both sit up and they just watched me. And I, I, at that point, I'm thinking there's gotta be some weird, maybe like there's a drug deal going on in the middle of nowhere, and these crazy hooded, snowmobilers are having a party back behind the reeds. I mean, my brain was kind of doing that scramble, trying to process what I was looking at. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind, it either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Brian, host of Undertaking the Podcast, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, the one and only Sasquatch Chronicles.
Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Uh, We're going to be chatting with Ethan, and Ethan comes to us from Minnesota. He had a very strange encounter when he was out there ice fishing, uh, which is something I would love to uh, love to do at least once in my life. Uh, But he was out there ice fishing and saw two of these creatures. Very strange encounter. And we're also going to be chatting with Lenny. Lenny comes to us from Washington State, and uh, he had a very strange encounter, a bluff charge, but a lot of weird things happened around the bluff charge. Uh, If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Ethan to the show. Ethan, thanks for coming on. Uh, No problem, Wes. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here. And I know you have your Northwind studio. Uh, If everyone, I'll I'll include a link underneath this episode. Uh, It's on Facebook, Northwind Studio. And uh, Ethan sent me this really cool chainsaw carving of Sasquatch. Uh, what, What kind of made you, I know we had an encounter, we'll get into your encounter, but tell us a little bit about the business and how you got into carving with chainsaws. I think it's cool as hell, man. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely not something you go to school for. I was, um, uh, taking an apprenticeship course in Northern Minnesota. We, we built these handcrafted log homes and we did them with a chainsaw, just these huge timbers out of Canada. And, um, our, uh, our crew always got requests for carvings, bears and, and, you know, things like that to go with the cabins and, and none of us knew how to carve. And so one day I'm like, you know what, I'm screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to take a log and, and start carving on it. And uh, it took me a while. My first couple carvings, I, I think I, I burned the first two I made. They were horrible. But I, I stuck with it and uh, ended up getting a few decent-looking bears. And, and and it wasn't long before it becomes, um, you know, like a, a part of what um, – of, of working with a saw. I would just start carving, tune out the world, and – I could I could make stuff if as long as I could see it in my head I could make it and uh, so I did it kind of as a hobby for a while then when my wife and I got together five years ago um, we wanted to, I wanted to get out of the construction industry and uh, she was a paramedic and we wanted to do something closer to home where I could be more um, closer to my family and so I started carving we started Northwind Studio and uh, it was an art studio worked with wood worked with a lot of um, driftwood and and storm down trees and things like that and I just started carving full-time and uh five years later i mean it is actually uh become a, a really fun full-time business for us it it takes me all over the country and and i'm able to create all kinds of stuff so yeah it's a lot of fun yeah i'm gonna have to end up buying that sasquatch one before <laughs> before someone contacts you and gets it yeah that that one that one's gonna end up being my favorite it's my first it, it's definitely i mean i go out i actually went out in the studio earlier because it's finished now and I kind of walked around it, you know, when, when you make something, you want to like kind of look at it again and see. And every time I go in there, I'm like, oh my God, you're, it's exactly what was in my head. It, it, it kind of reminded me of some of the stories people had told you. And I want to take it and stick it out on a bike trail somewhere just, just to see what happens <laughs> yeah, at night. It, yeah, it's cool. I hope everyone goes out and checks out uh, Northwind Studio on uh, Facebook. Uh, Ethan's a pretty talented guy. Now, Ethan, you actually had an encounter in uh, Minnesota. What was it, about eight years ago? Uh, I think it was uh, 2011, so nine nine years ago. Nine years ago. I was ago. trying to think the exact date, but it was, I think, February of 2011. Um, yeah, it was in northern Minnesota. It was – I had been up there a couple of years already and uh, hadn't really acclimated to what – the winters were like, I, I grew up in the East coast and in kind of a very moderate climate. So Minnesota winters just, boy, they just, they, they took a toll on you. And, and I, I, you know, working outside all the time, um, was also rough. So in the weekends, Saturday and Sundays, I, I took up ice fishing. Um, it was like the only thing you could do outside. And, uh, I actually found I really enjoyed it and I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of equipment. I had a little, tent um and a hand auger and a sled and instead of trying to go out to the big lakes i i would go on google earth and i would try to find these little remote ponds 
um, usually ones that, that look like they had access to larger bodies of water, but that were inaccessible for, to boat or whatever because of swamps or marshland. And, and I would trudge out there with my little setup and um, drill a hole. And sometimes I would sit there all day in the cold and get nothing. And sometimes I'd pull up these huge fish. It was just, it was new to me and it, it became really exciting. You know, it was like finding these little pockets um, and yeah, I, 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 I loved it. And, um, that this particular day when I, when I had my only encounter actually, and the, the first time I even really was aware that there was such a thing as a, a Sasquatch, I had found this lake kind of right on the edge of this marsh. There's a lot of marsh in Northern Minnesota, a lot of peat bogs and marsh and I found this little lake right on the edge where I knew no one could get to outside of the winter when everything was frozen over and I was really excited about it it was it was way off the beaten track I had to kind of drive down a dirt road and then hike through the woods and um, this particular day it was a Saturday it was it, it was really warm for February usually it was in the single digits but it was almost 50 degrees that day and so I was just I was sweating by the time I got out to this lake. So I, I took off my coat and my hat and I was on a t-shirt and I, I drilled a hole through the ice. And I mean, it's just pristine. I mean, just wilderness. There's nothing as far as you can see um, out to the West at the edge of the lake. There were these reeds that kind of surrounded the whole lake They're you know, six, seven feet high. And then beyond that, it was just marshland. So I, I, I get, I sit down, put my fishing gear in and just kind of hang it out and it's probably, I mean, it wasn't that long. It was 20, 30 minutes sitting there. I, I look over to the other side of the lake and I notice it was the craziest thing. It was like this head and shoulders kind of lifted up above the reeds. Um, it, it could remind me what it would look like if like you did a puppet show and you stuck a puppet up above a curtain. It just kind of rose up like that slowly and, and just stood there. It was just a, a head and shoulders. It, you know, at the time, I remember um, thinking that someone had was must be standing on a snowmobile behind the reeds in this huge winter suit. And it was really, the figure was in, incredibly dark, um, almost black. And it was a head and then sh these big shoulders. It, there was no, like there's no neck or, or, and you could see part of the chest too. Um, and so the only thing that, that I could reasonably, and I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like a scary experience. There was no noises. It was dead quiet. I, I, my brain's going, I must've, there, there must be a, a guy on a snowmobile standing up to get up above the reeds in this huge winter black suit. And it didn't make any sense to me because of how warm it was. And, um, also didn't make sense to me because there was no snowmobile tracks anywhere or trails and, and it's, and it's dead quiet for you know, the whole time walking in. And so I'm kind of looking at it, trying to kind of make sense of it. And it, it just, it just shrinks back down. The, the head and shoulders go back down. It disappears. And it's like, okay, that was just strange and weird. Uh, a few minutes later, two of them pop up, uh, the same one as before. And another one uh, about the same size and maybe a little bit smaller. And, and they both sit up and they just watched me. And I, I, at that point I'm thinking there's gotta be some weird, maybe like there's a drug deal going on in the middle of nowhere and these crazy hooded snowmobilers are having a party back behind the reeds. I mean, my brain was kind of doing that scramble trying to process what I was looking at and trying to make sense of it based on what I was familiar with in that area. And they, they, they watched me for a while, it, it, totally silent, not moving, just watching me fish. And I remember thinking that I should probably be scared, but it was so weird and it was so quiet and it was such a bright, sunny middle of the day. Just, it didn't feel scary at all. It just felt just kind of a little bit surreal. And after about, I, I don't know, 20 minutes almost of them just, just quietly sitting there and I, I would glance up at them. I would pretend I didn't see them and then look up again and they both went down behind the reeds and that was it. And I, I hadn't got any bites or anything at that point. So I, I kind of packed it up um, right after that. And I'm trying to figure out, I, I remember thinking I'm going to find out where that snowmobile trail is that they got in 
to the back of that marsh. And so I walked, um, I walked to the edge of the, the pond I was at. And I remember it was a lot farther to the reeds than I thought. Like I was using what I saw as a reference point. And I guess the size really threw me because trying to visualize them as two humans, um, I thought they could only be about 50 yards away. And I remember walking over, it was a lot farther than 50 yards and the reeds were a lot taller than, uh, you know, what I imagined them to be. I remember I could, I could put my hand up and kind of touch the top of them and I'm almost six feet. So I'm like, Oh my God, these, you know, and, and I didn't go into the reeds. I got up to the reeds, realized there was no sounds of a snowmobile that that was definitely not two people standing up on a snowmobile. And, um, so I kind of jogged back to my gear and put it all up and, you know, went through the woods of my truck. And, and it wasn't until that evening when I met up with a buddy of mine at a restaurant, we were having a beer and I told him like, man, th- th- I had the craziest thing happen to me out ice fishing today. And I told him what I'd seen and he got, his eyes got really big and he was like, Oh my God, you, you saw a Bigfoot. It's like, what do you mean? What the heck's a, cause I mean, I, I had never, nobody up there mentioned Bigfoot. Um, and yeah, he started just giving me his little, um, download on what he knew about it, which wasn't much. I went home that night, got on the computer and I mean, I just, you know, you just start Googling and stories, Minnesota, Bigfoot, whatever. And it was just crazy. It was like this door opens up and there was all these stories from the reservation and from the police and from local citizens. And I was like, how does all of this exist? And I've never heard about this. And so then obviously going back over it in my mind, I'm like, those things were huge. They had to have been, I don't know, eight or nine feet tall to get their entire shoulders and head up above those reeds. And they were so quiet. I mean, it wasn't even like, um, you know, you hear a lot of the stories of the crashing, but these things, they, they must have been sitting there at the edge of the lake when I pulled in and they just wanted to check me out, see what was, what the heck I was doing out there. So, yeah, it's a very cool encounter. And I was thinking the same thing as you were talking, you know, if you're six foot and you're putting your hand up to the top of the reeds, it had to have been at least eight, nine feet tall, you know, and if it would have been snowmobilers, obviously it wasn't, but you think the normal human reaction would be like, Hey, how's it going? Or wave at you or, you know, something to that effect instead of sitting it there and just watching you like some stalker, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that, that was, um, I mean that, that was, it made you really uneasy because your, your normal interaction with people is that they're, well, at least my experience with people is that they're twitchy. They don't, they don't stand still. People move all the time. Even the way that they move is very obvious to us. I was thinking if someone, you know, later on, if someone's standing up from a snowmobile, they're kind of going from a crouch position or lifting their head up. And that's not what happened. These things, their heads just kind of came straight up. Like I said, like a puppet show, it was the strangest thing. And they were so quiet and so still, there was no movement. Um, I, I really wish looking back on it, I, I wish I would have kind of I don't know. I wouldn't wish I wouldn't have gone near, but I wish I would have looked a lot closer at them. I was trying to pretend more like they weren't there, hoping they would go away, hoping I wasn't interrupting some, you know, illicit activity. I just didn't want to cause any trouble. Um, because I, I, I remember the one thing that really bothers me is I had a really hard time remembering the facial features because they were so dark. There wasn't this huge contrast between the face and the head and the shoulders. It was all, really dark that's why i thought they were wearing hoods um so yeah and you hear that with a lot of reports there's um a a lot of reports i've taken from people with hunters i remember one guy i talked to he said you know i i've never seen a sasquatch but let me tell you about this weird guy i ran into with a fur (laughs) coat and it had a hood on it and i mean he's basically describing a sasquatch but the i think the 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 way their sometimes their skulls are kind of have that gives that appearance of a hood, you know, kind of that, um, a different type of shape head than we have. Oh yeah. 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 There was not, you know, it looked like someone had put this immense shoulder pad underneath a coat and then thrown that, that full head covering hood on. Cause it was, you know, these massive shoulders and then a head with no neck. And it, it you know, it looks like if you stuffed somebody and put like 12, layers on top of them that it looked like a stuffed human 
is what it reminded me of when it came up. That's why the only thing I could think of was those huge suits that they wear, the snowmobilers, but I'd never seen a suit that looked like that. But, you know, when you're trying to reference something that you can't reference, your brain just does this scramble for, you know, whatever it can find to explain what you're doing. Yeah, it's almost kind of like your brain resets, almost like when your computer resets, you know, trying to figure out what you're actually looking at. You know, I want to ask you about the lights because you and I talked about the lights and I did that episode about the Foo Fighters um, and these weird, strange lights people see in the woods. Uh, be- before you get into that, t- tell me what you think Sasquatch is, Ethan. I'm kind of curious what your opinion is. Ooh. Uh, so that's, I mean, I mean, you know uh, how that question evolves in your head the deeper you get into it. I remember when I first started after that encounter reading it, my instinct was to go to, there's just an undiscovered animal out in the woods. Obviously there's lots of undiscovered animals and it's not hard, you know, growing up. Um, I grew up in the woods and I did a wilderness survival class for a number of years. And so I know that we do not know the woods like we think we do. So I thought it'd be easy for, you know, even something that big to hide. Um, so for years, it kind of, that was my narrative. That's what I used to justify everything. And, and then um, I started getting into a lot of Native American folklore and because they have so many stories, so many stories about these creatures. And the thing that struck me, and I remember when it happened, I, I was reading about these this Native American tribe up in the Pacific Northwest up by Vancouver Island, and they would trade. They called it a tribe. They would trade with these creatures. The creatures would bring them like salmon, and they would trade. I don't know what they would trade with, but they could talk to them using sign language. Um, according to the, and so then it struck me like that, there's no way that's a monkey because you don't communicate with monkeys. And so then that whole human element came in. I'm like, well, maybe they're people. And, and then I was trying to figure out how that's possible. And, and, you know, there was these crazy links to, um, the biblical stories of, um, the fallen angels and then like the mound builders and it, but it, none of it seemed to, to fit what, Bigfoot was or Sasquatch wasn't in terms of what people had seen and experienced. And so um, the last couple of years, and actually, especially since listening to your podcast, I, I've, I've kind of um, come to believe that they're, they're an actual um, genetically created creature that um, I, I remember hearing uh, a couple of years ago about how the Aztecs created corn using genetics and, and scientists don't even know how they did it. it they, there is no natural corn. It's a, it's a basically a new plant that was genetically created by merging two or three plants together. And the scientist who wrote this article I was reading was like, we can't even do this today, um, create this new species. And, and I remember thinking, you know, listening to your podcast and listening to some of the strange abilities these creatures have. I'm like, you know, if, if thousands of years ago, these Aztecs had the ability to create a whole new species of plant, who knew if thousands of years before that, there weren't, you know, civilizations that could create whole new species of animals, you know, and people. And, and um, if that's the case, then what I think that they were doing was actually trying to create some, something that would, I guess would be considered like a foot soldier or something like that, where in the old days you don't have bombs or guns. You, you, you literally have the strength of your soldier and you have the strength of your fortress. And so you create these big rock fortresses and you create these basically genetically engineered um, creatures that can protect you or your tribe or your civilization. And as those civilizations died out, and um, I think a lot of these creatures just kind of got scattered across the world. I, I don't think they're, human i don't think they're animal i think they're there's something that kind of like corn has been created using things that we have here on earth and and uh some things that we don't have so anyway that's where i'm at right now yeah it's a fascinating point actually i've never heard that before but you know if you read up on the anunnaki i mean they were creating a subspecies to do work for them um and you know the it's not just fairy tales. I mean, there's a long history of the Anunnaki. I'm not saying that's where Sasquatch comes from, but you're right. That It always amazes me when you talk to people and they say, well, you know, we, we came from cavemen. And if yeah. you go back and look at some of the different structures they made in the past, um, 
And you're telling me cavemen made this? I mean, there's stuff they did in the past we can't even do today with the machines that we have today, you know? Exactly. No, that's that's exactly right. You see these people moving, you know, thousand ton stones cut out of rock. and We can't even move that with our equipment. And what are they building and who's building it? And, um, you know, I mean, as you know, there's 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 a segment of science that's off limits. You just it's not talked about. It's it's just not part of our academics. And that's the kind of stuff that fascinates me and, and has fascinated me since I've been a kid. And and the more I find out about it, the more I'm like, we, we have no idea what our history looked like. We really don't. I mean, you mentioned it a lot about the time of Noah. And I'm like, we don't even know what that what that looked like, because for all we know, I mean, I, I know I've heard of these things called Ica stones in Peru, where they uncovered like 11,000 stones with etchings on them. This farmer did in his cornfield. And, and there were pictures of these native America, these native Aztecs or, or tribes, you know, harnessing these dinosaur looking creatures and putting battle armor on them. And I'm like, what in the world did the, that world look like back then? You know, what if it was, what if it was like, you know, middle earth, what if it was trolls and, and dinosaurs and humans and, and these big beasts that could, you know, who knows what they could do on a battlefield. I would never want to charge one ever. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It is fascinating when you look at the history. I don't think the history we know uh, it has any truth to it. I think if people knew the real history, they'd probably be terrified of half oh, the stuff that went on. You know? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think I don't think academics would could survive it. I just don't think they could. I, um, I think they have to keep everything pretty cut and clean and safe. And I don't know. I, I, I think it's fascinating, though. I, I'm, I'm glad there's people like you that are gathering information because there's nowhere else to go and get it. There really isn't. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. Tell me about the lights. I'm really curious about this light encounter that you had. Yeah. So that was I was also in northern Minnesota. That was actually closer towards the Canadian border. It was... um. It was actually just a few months before my run-in with the Sasquatch. It was in the fall during hunting season, and a buddy of mine and I, we would hunt the the edge of this peat bog. It, it, you can look it up. It's it's the it's like the largest um, peat bog in the lower 48 states outside of um, Alaska. It's just huge. There used to be reindeer herds out there or caribou herds, I think, at one point. And then during the Great Depression, they, um, arm, the uh, CCP came in and tried to drain it and make farms out of it. It never worked. It just killed off the caribou. And I don't know, sad story. But anyway, it's, it's a really remote area. And I love to hunt it because it was the only place during hunting season you could go and not run into other people. Um, and it was all public land. So my buddy and I had set a blind up right on the edge of this peat bog. We got up really early one morning and drove out there. It was probably you know, four four thirty in the morning. So pitch black, you know, just pitch black. We wanted to get out there a couple hours before the sun rose up. And um, we hiked back on this little snowmobile trail, probably, you know, a mile or so uh, to the edge of this bog. And we're almost to where our ground blind is set up. And we're at the point where we're past where the trees are. So we can look out over the bog. Um, great, you know, great area to, to hunt deer because you can see them coming for miles. And these like I think there were three or four of these little I mean little basketball size lights came kind of floating up out of the bog they were kind of hovering just I mean just a few feet above the surface and I couldn't tell how far away they were because I didn't know how big they were I didn't really have a reference it was pitch black but they were very bright very bright and I point them out to my buddy he had seen them too as soon as I saw them and we're looking at them and at first I'm thinking what kind of aircraft is out here in this peat bog at four in the morning. But then I realized there's zero, I mean, no sound. There's no sound of a motor, of a propeller, of an airplane, no whine. It's just total silence out there. Um, I mean, total silence. And we're watching these and they're, they're all moving across the surface kind of back and forth and around, but they're moving in unison. And so in your, in my brain, I'm trying to see what they were attached to because they were really bright. And since they were moving together, I figured they must be attached to an object or a shape, but there was no, there was no discernible craft. It wasn't like, you know, a UFO where you see this spherical thing. It was just the lights. It was just these lights hovering above the peat. And then after a few minutes, they, they started kind of like doing a circle pattern and they kind of, they rose up 
um, off the ground. And then as it, as they started coming off the ground, they got faster and faster. And then they kind of went over towards the West where, where we figured, you know, um, there must be some secret military base or something. I remember talking about it later with them. I'm like, there's got to be some sort of government spy craft or, but it was, I had no reference point for that either. That was the only time anything like that's ever happened to me. And I had never, I mean, it was, I actually don't think I really heard anything about orbs until that podcast you put out, the Food Fighters. I had no reference points for what I had seen until you mentioned that. And I, I started looking into that and realizing that a ton of people have actually seen these things. And, um, but yeah, for me, it was just crazy to be out there. I mean, there was nothing in between me and Canada, nothing except bog and peat uh, floating, you know, floating marshland. And there were these bright little, you know, balls of light just hanging out over top of it. So, yeah, it's very strange. What were they all the same color? They were all the same color. Yeah, they were all the same color. I remember they were really, I think it's because it's really, it was, I mean, incredibly dark. There, I don't think the moon was out. It was a little overcast. So it was really, really dark. And we were using our red light. So we didn't want to use our regular flashlights to scare the animals off. So we're using that red cast. So we, we were, we were in a really dark environment. And so they were just extremely bright. Like they could, they were illuminating the ground that they were hovering over. That's how bright they were. Um, I'm curious, what color were they, Ethan? Um, you want to remember they were more white than yellow. They weren't like, there was no like reddish or yellow. It was, it was more of a white, I don't even know what you call it, like an iridescent bulb. Um, but, but yeah, and they weren't, they weren't pulsating or flashing. Uh, they were just a steady, almost like someone had, had taken a, a, a perfectly round light bulb and, and lit it up from the inside. Yeah, it's no. bizarre. A lot of I would say probably more people see the lights than they do Sasquatch, and and it's strange. There is a long history of of the lights. I mean, even with the Native Americans, they talk about the lights, you know. And then the World War II pilots, the Foo Fighter, you know, they called them Foo Fighters. Uh, they would talk about them. And if you read a lot of those accounts, it sounds like modern day accounts of what people see in the forest. Uh, what what's your take on the lights? What do you think that they are? Oh my, I, I. I mean, maybe people have theories. I think it's fascinating that they exist kind of like as a bridge between so many different strange things like paranormal encounters and UFOs and cryptids. And I never knew that. I never knew that that, that was like a common theme. But, I, I, you know, it's not like Bigfoot. I hadn't done 10 years of reading stories and stuff on it. I, I just came across it. And I talked about it with a couple of my buddies just about a, a week ago and, and we had no idea. I'm like, I mean, is it a, is it like a, a drone that whatever is sending out is sending it out to look things over or is it an electrical device that they can use to, uh, I remember I saw this one crazy video of these things flying above a, a, cr a crop circle as the crop circle was happening like i don't know if it was a faked video or not it, it seemed like it was pretty legitimate but they say that they see them a lot during there and so i i don't know if they're craft or if they're you know like a maybe a portal or i i mean i think a lot of stuff that we consider to be ball lightning i've seen videos of ball lightning i think a lot of stuff that people consider ball lightning is actually those orbs actually you know i don't think it's just like lightning that gets stuck in the atmosphere so so who knows? I mean, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I, I haven't really been able to place those um, with anything that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I would agree with you. I think the ball of lightning is pretty rare. And it's, uh, you know, whenever people see these these lights, kind of like how you described them, they seem to almost like a drone. They seem like someone's flying them, you know? Yep. It, oh, no, these things, I mean, they were synchronized. That was what was crazy. They weren't random kind of bobbing up and down and doing, they were, they were a synchronized, obviously controlled device. Um, that's why I thought it was military aircraft. And I mean, but the fact they make no noise, whatever it is that they're using to fly doesn't make sound, uh, at least not that I could hear. Um, yeah. And that's how everyone describes them. I mean, I've seen it. It, it made no sound when I saw it. And it's, it's kind of unnerving. It's kind of a pretty light. It's not like a, uh, well, at least in my experience, it wasn't like a, a spotlight coming on. It was kind of a, it was a bright light. Don't get me wrong. 
Yeah. Uh, kind of like a fluorescent almost. Kind of a, um, I don't know, fluorescent's the best way to describe it. But you're right. The, the luminescent. Light, luminescent, it's yeah. Luminescent. It, it creates, it creates a, you know, enough light to see, but it's not, you're right. It's not a spotlight. It's not like it's a beam shining somewhere. It was just. It's like coming from the inside out. Yeah. It's real yep. bizarre to see. Yeah. That's very cool encounters, man. I'm, I, I'm so happy you came on to uh, share the encounters and I really hope people go and check out the North wind studio, a uh, very talented guy. Uh, I'm telling you, Ethan, I, the, the Sasquatch <laughs> sculpture he did was, it was badass. Uh, but I appreciate you coming on, man, and sharing what happened to you. Oh, uh, thank you, Wes. I mean, it, it was an honor for sure. I, I absolutely love what you're doing, and keep up the good work because uh, we could we could use a few more stories these days. Yeah, the honor was mine. Next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Lenny. Lenny, thanks for coming on. Thanks, man. Uh, thanks for giving me a call. Yeah, well, your email really piqued my interest. I know you had mentioned in the email about being bluff charged, and I know a lot of weird things happened. The encounter happened near Lake Easton back in 2019. Uh, if you would, Lenny, just kind of start from the very beginning. Kind of tell us what you were doing and and what happened. Okay. Um there's a little bit leading up to it. I got more serious into the subject matter after I attended the uh, Bigfoot conference in 2016 at Ocean Shores and uh, learned a lot doing that. So then I, you know, go out and hike and things like that. But I don't know if it's just me or if it might happen to other people. When you first kind of get into it, everything is Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And I, <laughs> I had to like kind of calm myself down and go after more facts. I bumped into a lady over here in um, Eastern Washington. She was telling me, you know, again, it's secondhand information, but she told me in this area that some Washington State University students were uh, researching a family group in this area. So I said, okay, so I decided to hike up there, and there's no, like, regular big parking lot for a lot of vehicles or anything. It's just a dirt road, and you, you pull over, and you start up this trail. And it's, you know, it's got a creek on it. And... I'm about a half mile up. It's it's towards it's towards the evening, about six thirty or seven, and about halfway up, about seven eight feet up, um, eight inch tree had been snapped over, but it's sitting perfectly across the trail that you have to walk around it, and I I thought that was strange. And then next to it were some smaller trees that had been just bent over. And I, you know, I analyzed it and it just didn't look like to me that snow would have done that. And, you know, what I've heard listening to your show and, and learning a lot from this show that my interpretation is they don't want you to either go any farther where that tree is across the trail or, Maybe they've got little ones, and that's their boundary. And I, I had gone out five to six times in other places and was kind of striking out, and I was getting kind of bummed out. You know, you have your ups and downs. So I decided to walk past it and went a couple hundred feet. Let me back up. The whole time I'm driving out to this area, I said, I'm not going to do a wood knock right away. I'm going to, I'm going to wait. I don't, I don't know what that means to them. So I um, sat down on the trail and I did a whistle. And from across the creek, up on this other hillside, I heard a reply. But I said to myself, no that's just your mind. You're wanting to hear 
what you wanted to hear. I, I, I just blew it off. Um, hiked a little bit more. All of a sudden, there's this three-foot wide path off of the main hiking trail that's worn a lot more. And I'm going, that doesn't make, that doesn't make sense. It's like, you know, a game trail from deer and elk are just maybe a foot wide. And there was this huge, big uh, tree laying down. It was about three feet across. And so I kind of sat down in there and kind of hid. I did another whistle. And uh, across the creek, I got this light tapping noise, kind of like a real mellow wood knock. And I'm going, holy crud, That maybe that whistle was legit. I... Um, I did a wood knock reply back. I, there was this little limb next to me, and I just hit it against that big tree that was laying down. Wes, all of a sudden behind me was this big, like, limb snap, and that's it. Like, you know, if it would have been a bear or a deer or an elk or a cougar, you would have heard it running off on all fours. No, it was just one big snap. And I'm going... Maybe this was true that there was a family group and there's usually two of them. And I said, man, I checked my, I was looking in my backpack and I forgot, I forgot to pack my nine millimeter pistol. And like, that's not going to do anything anyway. It's just reassurance. But I had my bear spray and I'm going, okay. So I'm, it's starting to get a little dark now. And I said, okay, I'm going to hike a little bit farther, and I'm about an hour, hour and a half into this hike, and I'm going to do a wood knock. I keep, when I do my wood knocks, I take a piece. It's about 15, 16 inches long. It's like an um, inch and a half across. It's like a wooden dowel. I hit this one tree. Nothing. So I picked a different tree, and I hit that thing as hard as I could. And then I sat down with my back to the hillside, really, really thick brush hillside. I mean, you can walk up it. And about a second or two after that, Wes, I heard something bipedal, and it is just like flying towards me. And it, it's making this ungodly, like, huffing noise that you just you can't just describe it it's not real and on top of that and i've heard it from a few uh people that have told you reports it had the dinosaur noise after that so when i stood up and turned around in my mind i said what did i just do and i i'm turning around it sounds so close this thing's gonna kill me i i i seriously was i i thought i was freaking gonna die that day i mean this thing's like right there why can't i see it i can hear it but i can't see it and so i stood up as i'm looking into the brush i reached down because i had my binoculars but i'm keeping my eye you know i'm facing the hillside and no more than less than two seconds i'd say it's two to three hundred feet diagonal kind of across and going up the hillside, and it's still making that god-awful huffy noise and dinosaur noise, like something, you know, the noises from Jurassic Park. And then the like probably 100 yards away, and that was it. I'm going, oh, great. I, I got to walk out here, and this thing can come, you know, straight down as I'm walking out and um, get me. But I knew better than to run, and I just walked, you know, back to my truck um, with my bear spray in my hand. And then got in my truck, called the gal that had told me about this area, and she kind of laughed at me, even though, you know, she's, she's told me she's seen them twice, once in her yard and then once uh, going to work really early in this kind of same area. And we've, we've had a falling out since then. And uh, called my buddy Tristan, and he he calmed me down and asked some questions. And he's the type of guy, 
and I've learned a lot from him. It's, it has to be pretty factual with him. And, uh, that taught me a lot. And he called me down and then I called and talked to his mom, Pat, and she called me down. Cause I, dude, I, I was freaking upset. And then, uh, called my wife and she's going, Oh my God, you know, get home. The next day, the gal that told me around about the area, she wanted to go up there and I said, okay. And her sister-in-law went with us. So there was two gals and me and we get nothing happened. And we get right to the spot where I got bluff charge and I couldn't believe it. She goes, Lenny, do a wood knock. And I just looked at her and I said, you got to be effing kidding me. And I did one and nothing happened. Um, so then um, maybe it was four or five days or a week later, Tristan and Pat went up there with me. He put out two recorders and we put some apples up probably 10 to 12 feet high. We went back and got the recorders, but we walked a little farther this time. And we crossed the creek again. And this one spot on this hillside, just kind of visualize an escalator in the side of the dirt going up this hillside. It was like three foot wide steps. Something huge was walking sideways up this steep hill, but we, it was so soft. You couldn't, um, you couldn't see any tracks and and there was no deer or elk tracks around there. So we came back and Tristan got the recorders and he called me up about, three days later and told me that I think we left there around two or three in the afternoon. And he told me that eight hours after we had left something bipedal came and it was like messing with the uh, recorders. So that, that helped me verify that, you know, you know, something, something was kind of up in that area. This year I took a friend of mine, his name is Mike up there and we went off trail for a while. And this time I remembered my pistol. So him and I went up there and we found some, you know, people call them glyphs or tree structures that were very strange, kind of unnatural. And he found a track, which was probably 40 40 feet from where we had put the uh, apples in the recorder with Tristan. And we found a good track. It was like 14 inches long and about four inches wide. And then I, I missed the spot when Tristan and I were going up there, I was leading and then we were past the, my bluff charge area and Tristan spotted a, spotted a partial track going up the hillside. It, and he's, like I said, he's, it has to be pretty legit for him. And he was pretty excited about seeing that one. About a month ago, I went up there during the day, nothing happened. But when I was coming out, I got the sound like something hit its fist against its chest twice. And it, it was just, you know, just a strange sound. Let me ask you, Lenny, um, okay. when this same bluff charge you, uh, how far away from you was it when you heard it coming? When I first heard it with my back to it, it sounded like 60, 80 feet. And then when I stood up, I it should have been, the, the, the noise was so loud of it coming straight down this hillside at me in the brush that when I stood up and turned, to me, it sounded so close, it should have been 20 feet away, but it wasn't there. And what do you make of that? Because I know the area well. I mean, you and I are practically neighbors. Yeah. Uh, we're, both, we're both enjoying the smoke at the moment of the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the fires. Um, yeah. You know, and the only thing really we have is black bears. And right. a black bear, it, if they charge you, I'm not saying a black bear won't charge you, but if a black bear is going to charge you, you're in big trouble. It's not yes. going to stop coming. Yes. Um, and what do you make of that? When you turn around, there's nothing there. I mean, I've had, you've heard me talk on the show. I've heard yes. weird experiences where uh, me and my brother were uh, out hunting one time and 
I swear to God, it sounded like a uh, Clydesdale horse came and ran right between us. There was nothing mm-hmm. there, nothing there. Mm-hmm. Um, and but what do you make of that when you hear something this, so big and? Yeah, this this you know, and if you know all the listeners have done their research, there's different researchers, and I don't I don't really care what people you know think, but it it could be the woo factor and. Um, uh, I, th- I kind of feel it was cloaking on me. I really do. I mean, how, if the government doesn't believe or know anything about there, how in the hell or somebody thought up of the movie Predator when that thing cloaks? So that's, that's my interpretation. That's what I kind of feel happened. I mean, it should have been right, right there in front of me. And it's like, there's nothing. I do think there was a family group in there. Um, I'm thinking maybe the female one was across the creek when I got that first whistle. And this could have been the big guy saying, uh, I need to scare the heck out of this hiker and get him out of my area. I mean, there is weird stuff that goes on with Bigfoot. Uh, I yes. know you're a member of the show. You, you've heard them all. And uh, there is anyone that tells you that there isn't weird stuff that goes on with Bigfoot's probably lying to you. Anyone yep. that tells you that's in just a North American great ape we haven't caught up with, probably lying to you or being disingenuous, one or the other. Uh, exactly. Because there is something very strange going on. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the Jurassic Park sounds. What, what kind of noises were you hearing? When you say that, what do you mean? Well, it's, I always go back. I, I figured it, that scene where the two kids are in that, in that kitchen hiding from what those little raptor things or whatever they're called. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that, that noise was on top of like this, this huffing thing. And it's like, it just didn't make sense. It really didn't. What keeps you going back to that area? Just curiosity. Yeah, big time. Um, yeah. It's, it's you know, um, it keeps me it it keeps me out of trouble, and you know, plus I get a good hike in. Um, I I know a little bit now, you know, and everybody's got everybody's got their opinions and this and that. I I just I I want to more. I'd like to see you know some. People say they get a something out of their corner. I have a flash. Um, I just want to see one probably with, you know, some people do. Um, uh, yeah, but, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not breaking your balls about it. No, I, mean, I, I know that. Yeah. I, I get it completely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think curiosity gets to all of us. And it's like I always say, be careful what you wish for because well, you might just get it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that when, when, when I um, – when I was sitting down there by that big log and I heard that snap, I actually heard your voice saying, be careful what you wish for. And I'm going, Oh God, he is, he is right. You know, true to form. It's, it's, it's correct because, Oh, so many guys that have told you reports. I mean, they've unloaded rifles onto them and stuff like that. And it's happened worse. So I, I was really lucky. It was just, scaring me and, and getting me out of there yeah what what kind of got you into bigfoot lenny i'm curious so you go to that conference was it just something you've always been fascinated with or what made you kind of go to the conference and then go hey i'm gonna go check out this area and see what happens yeah it, it goes back to the patterson gimlin film um you know saw that in the in the 70s and um checking out books and um you know, but at the time, you know, raising the kids and a mortgage. And then I was on top of that, you know, trying to race motocross, you know, just amateur level, nothing professional or anything. I did gold mining for, you know, dredging on the weekends for like 17 years. And now I'm retired over here on the east side and I've got more free time. You're not going to um, see or look, find any tracks unless you get out there and hit the trails. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. It, you know, you bring up the uh, the Predator movie. It's it's funny you bring that up. My son wanted to watch it. And uh-huh. so we sat and we watched it the other night. And as we were watching it, it, it really made me stop and go, kind of like what you said, where did they come up with that? 
And mm-hmm. you, I'm sure you've seen Barb Shoup. Uh, she's here in Washington State. She captured, uh, I mean, it looks like the freaking predator, right? Yes. You know, and, and Barb's not a master, I mean, sweet lady. She's not a master uh, video editor, you know, professional. Lo- There's no way that she could mm-hmm. have uh, fabricated that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, you know, and it does concern me a little bit because the more you get into the subject, the weirder it gets. You know, <laughs> Just like you've said before, just when you've got it, just when you think you've got it figured out, you don't. Um, I just, a month ago, I went on my first camp out with her group and talk about learning even more. She is a lovely person. Uh, I just had the most fun and my wife did and it was such a blast going on one of her camp outs it really was yeah i met her one time i can't remember where i met her at i can't remember if it was beachfoot i've met barb one time i remember her dog sweet very sweet lady you're absolutely right barb yeah barb's a very sweet lady mm-hmm. uh which is odd because you don't find usually nice people in the bigfoot world <laughs> but she's definitely one of the nice ones um, are you are you still going back? I mean, are you still wanting, or is it an area that you keep wanting to go back to? Oh yeah, it's it's like an hour. It's only an hour from my house, and there's another one even closer to um, uh, to Lake Easton, and I've had some strange things there. Of course, the um, I've put some apples out there; they always disappear. But I learned something from Tom Cantrell. He's written a couple books. And I started putting the apples in like a, a mesh bag so they can see them, you know, like an onion sack or something like that, or like the, the mesh sacks you get when you buy produce. And um, I put out colored, colored glass rocks, and I take pictures before and after, and they wouldn't take the silver colored ones, but they'd take the, uh, they take the green and blue colored ones. And then one time I went back and they didn't touch them at all, but they rearranged them. And last year, this other area, about the second time I went out there, there was two spent rifle shells about a foot away from my little gifting stump. And so I looked at all the trees. I'm not an expert, but I, you know, usually if somebody goes out shooting a rifle, I mean, you're going to shoot, you're either sighting in your your rifle for hunting season coming up in the fall or your, you know, target practice. You're not just going to shoot twice and then go back. And I looked at all the trees and sometimes people leave their targets when they're shooting out in the woods. I didn't see any of those. And then so I was kind of on the fence on it. I went back um, a week later where I'd left more apples out. The apples were gone and two more, two more um, rifle shells, you know, their, their old ones were laying there again. And I, I know where they came from and it's about 200 feet away where it looks like a long time ago, you know, it used to be like where some guys would have like an elk or deer camp. It was just different. Like you yeah. said, once you get into it, it's it it's worse. different. Yeah. It is. Yes. Yeah. If, uh, you know, you're not far from Bumping Lake, and that's a little oh, bit I, farther south from you. So yeah. if you get a chance, pretty uh, well, be careful going to that. I've had some very aggressive reports from Bumping Lake a lot um, over the I was, last two years or I so. Was, yeah. I was just there probably two months ago. I, I wasn't at the campground. I'm not going to say where I was at. But in the evening, I was doing rock clacks by the campfire. As, and a couple of times, my wife is hard of hearing. And she, she jumped one time something, oh, I don't know, 150, 200 feet into the, into the woods. We could hear, again, just one limb snap. And I go, do you hear that? And she goes, yeah. And so the very last night we were there, I do raw clacks i do like two maybe once every half hour and then i do like five real quick ones and i put out my recorder that night 
Next morning, it's about 6.30. I go get my recorder. Can see can see that it recorded, I think, eight or ten hours. I go back to the campfire. And my wife's still sleeping. And I'm starting to uh, listen to the recorder. And I got, you know, the, the earphone things in to hear the recording machine. And I hear this clack, clack. From where I just came from with the recorder to pick up the recorder and I go, no way. And so, and that was that bumping lake. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I go, I go and get my binoculars out of the, the trailer and I walk down there and I sat there for about 10 minutes, came back. Now the only time I did five really quick rock clacks was the night before. So I'm sitting there at the, fire again it's like about seven o'clock now in the morning and i don't have my ear ear things in i'm just kind of listening all of a sudden that same direction where i put out the recorder whack, 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 you know like the five rock clacks it's like it was letting me know or something it's like or it was um it was copying what i had done it's like holy cow so that that was good for me yeah yeah, no, I hear you. You know, and the, if you download uh, Audacity, it's free. Uh, you can take that eight hours and basically look at it, and you can almost see where. Um, so you don't have to sit and listen to your audio. Um, okay. Yeah, if you get a chance, Audacity, and you can just pop, and you can actually see where there's. After a while, you get to see different things. And maybe it's because I see it. You know, I can see where an um is at, or sure. different things when I'm interviewing people. But I know with uh, so you don't have to sit there and listen for eight hours. Okay, to okay, audio. that's the yeah, that's the hardest thing. Yeah, when you're getting into yeah. Uh, cool. What, what do you think that they are, Lenny? What's your opinion? Oh God, I was hoping I would be the only one person you'd forget to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> so that was no um, wrong answer. Yeah, I I know that every yeah everybody knows that, and it's you get some really good answers. Well, at first, you know, like after the conference, I. I thought it was, you know, the you know, gigantopithesis. After my my bluff charge and not seeing anything like I should have, um, I think it just it don't make sense. I think it's an interdimensional being. That's that's my opinion. You know, um, there's just too much. Weird stuff about them. You just, you, why is the government, you know, not bringing it forward to let us know it's it's not going to affect the forestry industry? Um, it's it's just too strange. Yeah, and I want to ask you this. And again, I'm not asking this to none of these questions. You know the show. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm curious when you say interdimensional being. What does that mean, and and where would it, where would the origins of something like that be? the The reason why I ask that question because when I think of interdimensional, um, you know, and I've I've said this to di many different people, I think of mm -hmm. demonic, uh, but maybe that's just the religious, you know, ex religious side of me talking. Mm -hmm. um, but when you say interdimensional, what what does that mean to you, and and what do you think of where where's the origins of something like that come from? Okay. Um, I think, I think it has to, to eat, uh, killing deer or elk or whatever, but I think it, it could be, you know, the portal thing. It could be, um, I was talking to a guy the other day, he saw me with one of my Sasquatch shirts on and his opinion was that the aliens had you know, sent them down here to get our gold. Um, but f for me, I, I just, it's part like paranormal where it just, it has the abilities to do stuff that us average human beings just can't comprehend. It's just, and the origin I think just comes from maybe a different planet. I, you know, it could be that or, like it could be stepping in out of uh, portals to a different dimension. No, no I was mm -hmm. just kind of curious what you thought. Sure. Uh, 
Um, you know, there is weird stuff that goes on with Sasquatch. Like I said, I mean, <laughs> yeah. there is some very bizarre things and it concerns me a little bit. I know with, um, you know, and, and again, I, I'm far from an expert on pretty much anything, but the, the one thing with the gifting, I'm always concerned when I hear of people doing gifting or, you know, because we don't know what they are. I remember one time, it was the, the two brothers episode, the, spirit medium lady remember she was talking about the woman in white and all the other things yes and she had taught one thing that she had said to the two brothers and it always kind of stuck with me uh because you know I, I used to always think well we're feeding them and then once you stop feeding them they get mad and if mm -hmm. you really think about that that really doesn't make any sense because what other animal or whatever on the planet gets mad when you stop feeding it mm -hmm. uh, you can stop feeding your dog your dog's not going to get mad it's just going to starve to death um, but one thing that she said was they don't give them anything and don't take anything from them. They see it more as a tribute. Now, again, oh. she could be wrong, uh -huh. but sure. it was fascinating. She used that term tribute and then it kind of clicked with me because you hear these stories of people who are feeding them. Then all of a sudden they stop feeding them like on a farm or something. And this thing will come through and kill everything, you know, all the livestock. And I mean, they just, go ape crazy after yep, yep. you stop feeding them. And when she yep. said tribute, I, that kind of made me stop and take pause a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying yeah, to tell got, you how to do things. You no, know I mean? you got a great point. Um, and, you know, it, I guess I want to see one so bad, you know, I want to try everything. But like I said before, I'm, I'm learning and uh, I, I try not to go by myself. Now I try to get people to go with me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a great point about feeding them. We, you know, nobody, nobody, uh, knows what they're going to do when you stop. It's a great point. Yeah. You have to let me know. I mean, let me okay. know what things work and what, what doesn't work. Um, I, I think you heard me talk one time on a show about, I played a, uh, baby crying. You can go to YouTube, yes. type in baby crying sound effect, and I'll yes. play for like two hours and it's like nails on a chalkboard, but it did bring something in. It definitely yep. brought something in, and um, the the guy from the Olympic project, he Derek, yeah, uh, he yeah, he's told the same thing. He and he, but he was way out there by himself. But he heard this thing coming, and it's like, I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> well, the the one thing I will tell you, it started to change my opinion because we did that at the Browns property. And there mm -hmm. were several people there uh, when I did the whole baby crying thing. And one thing that did surprise me a little bit, because even at that time, in my mind, you know, I thought, thought these were monsters, kill them all and let God figure it out. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that did kind of make me stop and take pause is whatever came in, it came in like a freight train, but it stopped on the edge of the wood line by mm -hmm. the sound tent that we had. And it started cooing. Um, almost like a mom would coo to her baby. And oh. that made me kind of, you know, for a moment stop and go, maybe they're not all killers, you know, maybe they're right, not all. Right. But, you know, try different things. You Keep me okay. up to date out there, will you? I let, will. Let me know if anything else happens. I sure will. And try and uh, hopefully we'll get some rain, man, get rid of this smoke. Yeah, this, I'm, this I'm dying. smoke is, yeah, this smoke is getting so old. Ugh. Yeah, it really is. But I appreciate you coming on, Lenny. Thank you so much for taking the time. Love your show, dude. You're doing a great job. Thanks, Lenny. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Have a great weekend, everyone.
Save me from myself 